Hi everyone, welcome to Lessons in Leadership with Steve Adubato and the one and only Mary Gamba. Mary, um, let's welcome in, let's get right to this with Ira Robbins, who is the CEO of Valley Bank, one of our longtime partners. And Mary, do you notice, while I have this new attire, that my tie matches the colors of what particular bank? Oh, I don't know. Could it be Valley Bank? What a coincidence. <laughs> Ira, go ahead, comment on it. I love it, Steve. It's the way to thoughtfully engage with your host or with, with your guests when you bring them on. So something I need to make sure I'm focused on as well. I love it. Leadership right there, Steve. Yeah. I, I and, I, and I also noticed that Ira has a new background. We've had Ira on many times. He's usually in that room with his door closed with a devil's jersey on the back of the door. But instead today, he's got a new ba background. Ira, why do you have a new background? So I would like to point, there is still a little bit of a devil. Uh, in okay, the good. <laughs> so I haven't given up my focus on uh, a better season, hopefully a Stanley Cup for the New Jersey Devils at some point. Mm, we need That's Jack that. Hughes to get back, though. I mean, at the time of taping this, Jack is nowhere to be found. So hopefully he'll yeah. be back soon. And we need a goalie at some point. Yeah, that well. kind of that, that's kind of important. <laughs> Well, the one thing about Ira, uh, one thing about Ira that I've always known as a leader, we've worked together for 15 years now, is he has um, very big dreams. And sometimes they're realistic and sometimes they're not. Uh, when it comes to, I'm a Rangers fan. But I I'm know. A, I know. I'm not going to get into it, but I do want to do this right out of the box. Let me also disclose that what Mary and I, through our firm, stand and deliver, we um, work with a great team at Valley Bank with the Valley Bank Leadership Academy. It's been four years now, I think, we've been doing it. And Ira signed off on that. He's been a key player in all that. But Mary, one of the things I want to talk to Ira about right out of the box is this. I'm not disclosing too much, but there was a, a, a forum, a strategy forum, I think, in Orlando. Am I correct about that? A few months back? Yeah. This is one of the messages of the many that Ira shared at the Valley uh, Strategy Forum. Is that the status quo not an option? And in all candor, Ira, the leaders that we're working with got a message from you that we need to step up our game, which is an expression. But I'm going to say this, producing better numbers, better bottom line. This is what's in my mind. Trust me, there's a question. I wrote pressure to produce. Do you believe that part or to what degree do you believe our job as leaders is to create healthy pressure to produce beyond where we are as opposed to, hey, Stressful times. We're good. Go ahead. It's, it's huge, right? I think you need to have a vision as to where you want to be. So what does that outcome look like? A healthy environment to succeed in that, I think, is important. And then the appropriate sort of push right, to make sure that we're getting there in a time that's probably uncomfortable for a lot of people, I think, uh, is sort of where we need to be from a, a leadership perspective. You know, far too often we hear if it's don't broke or if it's not broke, don't fix it. And that is the worst advice, right? Anyone could ever give to anyone. You Why? Know, the world is constantly evolving, processes, people, expectations, behaviors, everything changes. Uh, you know, we need to be on the precipitous as to sort of where we're headed as an, as an organization, where our clients are headed and make sure we're providing a value proposition for them. And the more we sit still and stick with the status quo and don't get pushed to be better to make ourselves better, we become irrelevant as an individual and as a company. Let me play devil's advocate a little bit before Mary jumps in. Because Mary's been uh, shoulder to shoulder with me in the Valley Leadership Academy. We constantly tweak the curriculum. We've added, in fact, uh, a seminar and a focus on wellness and leadership, which is a big focus uh, at Valley and, and frankly should be at every organization. But that's what, trust me, there's a connection here. Ira, how much do you think about the quote impact on the people of Valley when you raise the bar and create more pressure to produce better results? Do, to what degree do you say to yourself, well, this is the right amount of pressure. This is too much pressure. We might lose some people in the process. And by the way, some people, book good to great here, Jim Collins, some people may have to be escorted off the bus in the process because they can't hang with that pressure. I know there's a question in there somewhere, Ira. Pick it up from there. To me, it's a function of who you surround yourself with from a, a leadership team perspective. I am an impatient individual and I like to push without question. And, uh, you know, Tom Idanza, who's the president of the bank, you know, Yvonne Serwick, who's been on the show before, uh, are very good counterbalances to me to make sure we're, we're holistically looking at everyone else within the entire organ, organization. And I think a function isn't just surrounding yourself with the talented people, 
but the trust that we all have within each other to make sure that there's an open dialogue and an environment for pulling things back or actually speeding things up at times if maybe I'm not even being aggressive enough. And being an organization where there's just one leader pushing uh, sort of an isolation is never uh, a recipe for success. But I think having a talented, trusting environment uh, really, really caters to that uh, growth. Mary, along those lines, how often have you been the counterbalance to my pushing, <laughs> prodding, pressuring? This is it. We need a new series. Why don't we do this? Why don't we put, why don't we have someone do another job? We'll pay them a little more. But why don't we expand their portfolio? Mary's like, hold on. That's not realistic. Not only, Mary, you push back a lot talking about a trusted colleague and advisor. <laughs> Go ahead, Mary. Well, and you, and you can't be one of those people that pushes back just to push back. But as I was, Ira was talking about, it is that balance. And Ira, talk a little bit because we are talking about, obviously, there is no such thing as status quo. We were joking about your background. You made the decision in the midst of everything else, in the, in the midst of mergers and acquisitions, right, to physically move and not like move next door, like literally move from one county to another, unless I'm mistaken, they're not in the same county, Wayne to Morristown. Talk about that decision and how challenging it was as a leader to get buy-in from your team that has been really used to going away. And I remember, you know, literally going to the hockey rink. That's right in that complex. Years and years and years. How did you get buy-in for that? And By for way, me, let's make, we're not care. talking about Ira moving personally. We're talking about... No, no. Valley Bank. Yeah, their headquarters. Well, well, lifted and moved. Let's make sure, Mary, let's make sure we show an exterior shot because we're doing our seminars there. And it's a, it's a fabulous setting. Please, Ira. It was just as much for me as well as I was saying, you know, both of my kids play hockey. They play at the ice fall, which is right next door to where our headquarter building was. So for me, it's a longer commute and, uh, and, and less comfort even being where we were as an, as an organization. You know, but uh, we as a leadership team decided shortly into uh, us taking over the organization back at the end of 2017, 2018, what was the environment we wanted to work in and how do we think about providing an environment for our employees to be successful and where they wanted to come. So we really began the process actually back in 2018, uh, beginning of 2019 and starting to look in different areas as to what type of environment would be conducive that really respected the employees as well. You know, one of the things that we had across the entire bank for many years was dilapidated infrastructure, you know, chairs that were broken uh, from many of our branches, furniture that just didn't look appealing for somebody to want to come in and sit down. So as much as you say, how inviting is it to the client? You know, we started with what is it like for the employee, for the associate at the organization to feel respected, to feel as if we really do appreciate what he or she does. So for us, putting together a state-of-the-art building, facility, and not just in the headquarter building, this was the last building that we did. All the other regional centers were done first. Almost all the branches were done first, right? To prioritize the majority of the employees before we prioritize what the headquarter building looked like. All the training and development that we have for new hire orientations done in this building. So people have an understanding about what we're striving for, what type of organization we're, we're, that we're looking to become. And there's little pieces as you walk through this building. We talk about connections, what our responsibilities are. We talk about morals, values. All those things are really promoted throughout the entire organization. And it reflects itself in the individual building. One of the things I remember when we were in Wayne, the former CEO had pictures of golfers all around the building. And that's how we designed the building. Uh, and to me, it's not quite all that relevant. It's a missed opportunity to, to think about how we motivate and inspire our employees. When you walk through the building today, there's terms like legacy that sit through the entire building. There's terms about community involvement, opportunity, the key themes that we want our employees to make sure that's why they're here and to make sure that it's not just here from a client perspective, but it's here for their perspective as well. And those are the themes that are really built throughout this individual building here and all the buildings at Valley today. You know, it's interesting, Mary, when I first visited the Marstown, the, the new corporate headquarters, we had a, one of our Leadership Academy seminars there. Ira, don't ask me why, but Ira happened to be coming into the building at the same time, and he took me on a personal tour. And everything he's talking about right now, the signs that are there, the, the inspirational messages were powerful. But he also took me to an area, and I want you to talk about that, Ira. There was, there was an open area where I, I believe their meetings take place, uh, gatherings take, take place, social events, and also we're uh, trying to organize a Q&A with uh, Ira and myself on leadership. Uh, and if Ira doesn't mind, we'll be getting lessons in leadership 2.0, the tough stuff, which Ira was so kind to give us a testimonial on. Trust me, here's the question. Ira, you were so proud 
and 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 I could see the pride. You were talking about the windows, the the sunlight coming in that that room, and we'll show some video of this. Why is that room and that space so significant in terms of creating the environment for employees you're talking about? Look, I think it starts with what was the purpose to begin with, and generally speaking, top four best view goes to the board of directors behind a closed wall with an expectation that whatever goes on in that room is the most secretive conversation anyone's ever going to have. <laughs> it's true. You know, I'm, I'm not so sure that leads to transparency within an organization. So for us, it was not just, and by the way, they only meet eight to nine times a year. So it's the total amount of wasted space as well. So if you're trying to think about the environment as well, not, not, not really an ideal use for, for connecting what you say and what you actually do. So we decided to make a very different room for our boardroom where there's transparent glass that sits across. So anybody walking up there can have a vision and a view into where the bank is headed, what the directors look like and engage with directors. Community space is wide open so we can engage with our clients there, have much more employee and associate sessions. And what we've even recently begun to do is invite some of the, the stakeholders in our community to That's come right. in and have events in this session, in this in this room so we can engage with them and begin to hear firsthand some of the challenges and how we become better connectors within the community and maybe align on some of how we're allocating resources across the organization. Inviting people in for a conversation is much better than on the periphery trying to understand what's going on. Mary, think about how we're fully remote in our organization. And we got together recently with all of our team. It was a social luncheon and we, and people, some people had never met. Some people were seeing each other for the first time in a year or so. So when I was talking about this space, which I was fortunate enough to get to see, it reminds me of how important that human connection is. We've got another minute or so with Ira. Please, Mary. Yeah. And you talk about your people, Ira. Can you just talk a little bit about wellness and how you encourage a culture of wellness at Valley? I think it starts tone at the top. I mean, what do, what do you want them to do when it comes to balancing their life? You know, and I think I remember years ago, I, I, I went on your show and talked about, you know, putting things into a pie chart and making sure you have enough sort of time for everything. Right. And and that never works. It's how you are able to integrate your individual uh desires or sort of what you need to do, integrate them together. And for me, how we integrate personal life with regard to what your professional responsibility is important on our town halls, on many of the interaction I have with all of our associates. I talk about my responsibilities to my family, the amount of time I spend with my kids, how I choose to do certain things with, with my kids, as opposed to showing up for work on time in the morning. Mm -hmm. If they don't hear it from me, if they don't see it from a functional perspective as if I'm living it as well, then it just becomes lip service. And for me, those are intentional conversations I have, not because I want everyone in the organization to know how many kids I have or what I'm individually doing with them, but I want them to know balance is important and choosing your family is just as important in choosing work. That's where it starts. There's a lot of other programs we have throughout the entire organization that support the wellness. We have associate resource groups. Yvonne and her team do a wonderful job. But for me, making sure that it starts at the top and how I'm messaging it to them is critical to make sure that it's effectively done throughout the entire organization. And it just doesn't become another policy, another program, a lip service. A lot of checking off the box for some organizations, not at Valley. Ira Robbins is the CEO of Valley Bank, our longtime partners. I'm proud to be wearing, it's not an official <laughs> Valley Bank tie, but I think it could be down the road. Uh, Ira, thank you, my friend. Good luck to you and Mary and the Devils. We'll see what happens. We'll be back on Lessons in Leadership right after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, the Helix, Fedway Associates, Inc., the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Veolia, resourcing the world, Choose New Jersey, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, and the Meadowlands Chamber and Meadowlands Media.
Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. This is part of our series on discovery and innovation and leadership. We're honored to be joined by Dr. Stephen Labuti, who is director of Rutgers Cancer Institute and also senior vice president of oncology services at RWJ Barnabas Health, one of our longtime partners on the Caucus Educational Corporation side. Good to see you, doctor. Well, good morning, Steve. Uh, thanks for having me. You got it. Talk to Mary and I, along with our uh, audience on Lessons in Leadership, Talk about the transformation, excuse me, transformative investment, cancer research care at RWJ Barnabas Health in cooperation with the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, a huge, important collaboration. Please, doctor. Yeah, so uh, it's really uh, in the spirit of uh, bringing uh, the highest level of exceptional cancer care, as well as driving uh, cutting edge research for the people of New Jersey. Uh, we have a population in New Jersey of approximately 9 million people. Uh, the incidence of cancer of about 52,000 new cases a year. And we believe passionately that by leveraging the strength of the state's largest uh, academic health system, RWJ Barnabas Health, and the expertise, both with respect to clinical cancer care and cutting edge research of the Rutgers Cancer Institute, that we can really provide uh, the level of care that folks might otherwise think they have to leave the state to get. And it's our goal uh, that no one is farther than 15 or 20 minutes from a door that opens to that level of expertise if they're suffering with a cancer diagnosis. Such an important, innovative um, initiative, collaboration, partnership, a big theme on Lessons in Leadership. Mary? Yeah, definitely. I would love to hear Dr. Labuti a little bit more about the Jack and Cheryl Morris Cancer Center. Um, I read that it's the first freestanding cancer hospital. How is that different? What makes that unique from other cancer centers in the state? Yeah, so when we think about uh, the care for cancer cases and for cancer patients in the 21st century, it's really integrated multidisciplinary care. It's a team of experts uh, that are working together uh, bringing all the various modalities that are possible to get the best possible outcome. And we know uh, as a field uh, that the best care is delivered uh, in that setting, that multidisciplinary setting, and having a continuum of care from outpatient to inpatient and back again, because some patients require some of their care to be delivered in a hospital setting. And when you look at some of the great cancer hospitals around the country and you see the success that they have, uh, we felt it was necessary not only to build an integrated network across our health system with amazing outpatient facilities where patients are never more than 15 or 20 minutes from care, but to have a destination within that service line or system that was a fully integrated cancer hospital that cares only for cancer patients and cares for them through that entire journey, outpatient to inpatient and back again. But, but Dr. Labuti, another piece of this, and Lessons in Leadership talks a lot about talented people, recruiting talented people, keeping talented people, engaging them. But I'm thinking to myself, recruiting retention of world-class clinical and academic leaders. How challenging is the recruitment end of those folks to what you're doing? And then keeping them when they do have so many other options, please. No, it's a great question, Steve. And uh, I've been uh, at Rutgers and RWJ Barnabas now for just over seven years. Uh, and the, the mission, uh, the vision, the resources, uh, the commitment of the institutions has enabled me to recruit you know, over 70 uh, faculty uh, during my period of time here. And they're from all over the country. And I think they gravitate to where they feel they can make a difference. And certainly the opening of the Jack and Cheryl Morris Cancer Center as not only a cancer hospital and integrated outpatient facility, but a research institution with uh, new cutting edge research laboratories to add to our research footprint already has made it even easier uh, to attract the best and the brightest from around the country uh, that want to care for patients in a supportive environment that's gonna allow them uh, to uh, function at the highest level of their training and abilities. Mary? 
Yeah, I would love to talk a little bit about quality control. Uh, I know that you have the Cooperman Barnabas um, Center up in Livingston. We talked about Tinton Falls, New Brunswick. Being spread out and having such a large institution, if you will, how do you manage quality control? Because at the end of the day, patient care is forefront, of course, of your mission. How do you make sure that all of your physicians, nurses, staff really talk about that? Because at the end of the day, it's customer service. Yeah, Mary, that's a great, great question. And so we have an integrated oncology service line. Uh, what that means is that at the highest level, all the way down to the providers at each of our facilities, we are one integrated program. Uh, quality, patient experience, patient outcome uh, is primary uh, in our focus. Uh, we, The Cancer Institute in New Jersey always focused on the patient. And as we've grown, our North Star has been to make sure we remain patient-focused and patient-centered. Uh, and so no matter what door you walk in across our health system, whether you're in the northern part of the state, the central portion of the state, or along the shore, um, you're walking into that same integrated National Cancer Institute designated mm -hmm. comprehensive cancer center care. And we make certain uh, that there's no difference in the quality of care Although depending on the type of cancer you have and the needs of the treatment for that cancer, there may be different levels of acuity and we will navigate you to the location that's closest to where you live, but gives you the high enough level of care for the problem you're facing. And uh, right. it's it's integrated. Sorry for interrupting, Stephen. Uh, yeah, no problem. Dr. Labuti, one more follow up on my end. So you know uh, our, that our firm, Stand and Deliver, is very engaged in leadership development coaching. We've done a significant amount of communication coaching um, in connection with RWJ Barnabas Health. But I'm curious about this. Physicians, clinicians at the top of their game, extraordinary surgeons, researchers, people like yourself, where the heck does the leadership development part kick in, meaning is there an assumption you're a great leader if you're a great clinician or researcher or a surgeon? Uh, you're saying, where does it happen and how does it happen? If it's not, Mary's favorite word, more intentional and focused, go ahead, jump in, because I've been thinking about this a lot. Like, yeah, we, why do we assume people are great leaders because they're great clinicians and researchers? I don't know that you can ever assume anything. Um, I think it's a productivity experience and work product uh, that allows you to sort that out to some degree. We are intentional about creating opportunities uh, for our team uh, to assume leadership positions. Uh, we're not a top-down organization. We very much rely on the folks that are you know, on the ground doing the work uh, to rise up uh, into leadership positions because they have the experience, they have the understanding, they have the interactions that will help inform that. I think there you know, are certain things about uh, being um, in the field of medicine. Uh, I can only speak from my own experience as a surgeon. You know, I've been involved as a team member and then leading teams throughout my career in order to have the best outcomes in the operating room. It's a team activity, a team approach, and there need to be team mm -hmm. leaders or captains you know, during that, uh, during that activity to get the best outcome for the patient. But I think you know, my philosophy of leadership is uh, that uh, just because you have the title uh, doesn't grant you any magical powers or authority. Um, yeah. The most important things are setting a clear vision, communicating that vision, and motivating your team uh, to move forward, embracing that vision for the good of the people uh, that we serve. Uh, and uh, it's really service as a leader. You're serving your team as best you can uh, so they could uh, be as successful as they can, uh, and in our case, on behalf of the patients uh, we serve. Well said. Dr. Stephen Labuti is director of the Rutgers Cancer Institute and senior vice president of oncology services, RWJ Barnabas Health. Dr. Labuti, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you both. Thanks for having me. Lessons in Leadership. Be right back after this. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com. NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, and the Meadowlands Chamber and Meadowlands Media. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. Hey, Mary, um, 
remind folks this new book. I don't know, Scarlett. What's it called? It, what's it? What's it called? No. Called Lessons in Leadership. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sylvester on the back end will do a nice promo. Yeah, no, I'm he'll put it up there. It'll look better than you holding it and things falling out of it there. But yeah, Lessons in Leadership 2.0, the st tough stuff. Why did we write it? I remember it was March, April 2020. We were dealing with what everybody was dealing with. And Steve said, Mary, we've got a problem here. We need to revisit all of those lessons that we talked about in the original Lessons in Leadership and then some. And I love that we evolved. We pivoted because originally, if you remember, it was going to be lessons in leadership from COVID and beyond. And we said, no, it's not just about the pandemic. It's about everything in between, everything that happened in the six years since you wrote the previous book. So I'm mm -hmm. very proud of the pages and the lessons that uh, are in that book. Yeah. And you go to our website if you want to get more information on the book and purchase it. Listen, it's not like selling books matters. Hey, listen, Mary, let's do this. Got a couple of minutes left. Mary and I were arguing about this offline. We're taping this on the 30th of January. So Mary, this I know I use too many sports analogies. This is a good one. This, this I'm gonna frame it this way. So I, I was rooting for the Detroit uh, Lions only because they never won. Everybody and I'm was. rooting for the underdog. I think it was 60 some odd years before they were in a playoff since they've been, whatever. And here's the thing. You don't have to be a football fan to understand risk reward, playing it safe, playing it smart, being strategic. The coach of the Detroit Lions, Dan Campbell, is a great motivator, tremendous. They would not be where they are without him, except there were several times during an NFC playoff game where they had a chance to kick a field goal. No guarantee you're going to make it. Get up by three scores uh, and against the 49ers, but instead... He went for it, fourth and two, we're going for it. We're not going to kick a field goal, field goal. Fourth and three, we're going for it. We're not going to kick a field goal. Another time late in the game, tried all kinds of risky things. And Mary said to me, that's who he is. You, that's who you are. You got to you gotta go with the, the one who brought you to the dance. Well, and I said he was standing by his guns. The reason why he even made it to that game in the first place, and I'm so proud of myself now. Thank you, Dad, and thank you, Bill, for making me watch all these football games. I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. But, yes, I'm watching football games. But the reason why they made it to that playoff game in the first place is because he took those risks the entire season. So my my argument is why change up the format if it worked, people would have said he stuck to his guns. Good for him because it didn't work. It's so easy to be Monday morning quarterback and say, wow, he should have been more safe. So no, that, Mary, that was my argument. Mary, Mary, that's like saying, first of all, I respect his aggressiveness. I respect how much confidence he has in his team and his team's going to back him up. And I get it. But as a leader, don't you have to pivot? We talk about pivoting. If you're just who you are and that's who you mm -hmm. are, then you never pivot. If that's what the, you've been doing to get where you are, then you never have to adapt or innovate. But the reality is, even if that's your basic philosophy of leadership, we're going to go for it. We're going to be aggressive. At yep. times, you step back and go, oh, in this instance, it's not even playing it safe. It's playing it smart. you making right. it seem like that's being a phony. Well, no, but say if they did go for that field goal, they got the three, I keep calling it the field goal, but the, yeah, that's a field goal, right? Three the three points. points. If they got, all right. But if they, more. exactly. But if they got those three points and then at the end of the game, I know we have 30 seconds left at the end of the game, that if he would have went for it and the, you know, the touchdown with the extra point would have put him over the edge, we might be sitting here saying, you know, why did he change his leadership? Why did he change this? Why did he change that? I, I think it's, then how can I you know. say the status quo is never an option? When you're saying status quo, that's the only way to but go. It, not status quo, but also being confident in your decisions that had gotten you to that point so far. That That's where I'm coming from. So maybe the third time in that game, he could have pivoted. Yes. So let's agree to disagree. And we have to take a risk in life, according to Elvin Badger. So that is correct. And goodbye. This Elvin. has been Lessons in Leadership. Yeah, Steve, you're you right. do the we'll close. Say, we'll <laughs> say goodbye on this, but I'm going to say this. We have to take risks in life but they have to be strategic and smart and calculated, not just risk for risk take. Goodbye, everyone. I'm not taking a risk. We'll see you next time on Lessons in Leadership. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, the Helix, Fedway Associates, Inc., the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Veolia, resourcing the world, Choose New Jersey, and Seton Hall University, 
showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, and the Meadowlands Chamber and Meadowlands Media.